Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Amanda Brock. I'm CEO at Open UK, and I'd like to welcome you all today to the third in our series of Future Founders training. You may already have joined us with Matt Barker hosting you on the commercial sessions one and two, where we looked at uh, why form an open source business and product development and open source. Today, we're going to take a slight shift and we're going to shift right maybe to look at the legals and open source. Um, I'm joined today by three active participants in Open UK who you may or may not already know. So I'm going to introduce them briefly and ask each of them to say a few words about themselves. Let's start with the, the one I've known longest, Andrew. Andrew Katz, who is a partner at Moorcrofts and founder of Orcro. Andrew, would you like to say a few words about yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing um, in open source for over 20 years now. I used to be a coder uh, many, many years ago. Um, so my practice really focuses on advising uh, companies, individuals and organizations on open source liabilities. And um, I also advise on things like open hardware, open data, etc. Chris, do you want to go next? Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. Chris Easton here. So I'm also a lawyer. Um, and before I was a lawyer, I was a physicist. So having a, a technical background, I'm the chief legal officer at Open UK on a pro bono basis. Uh, and I'm a partner in the technology team at Field Fisher. Rochelle. Hi, I'm Rochelle. Um, I am general counsel at Open UK, a role I just started around a week ago. Um, and my day job is uh, head of legal at CloudReach, where we have had to uh, engage with a number of cloud related open source topics. Uh, so I've been with Open UK for around a year now. Thanks everybody for those introductions. I'm just going to take a moment to introduce myself a little bit more and also Open UK. Um, as I said, I'm Amanda. My background is that I'm also a lawyer and I spent 25 years, 20 of them in industry, working as a solicitor. And that was mostly internationally. Uh, I joined Canonical at the beginning of 2008 and spent five years where I set up and ran the Canonical legal team. So I've been working in and around open source for the best part of 15 years now. Um, at Open UK, I'm the CEO and we are the industry organization for the business of open technology. And that's not just open source software, which we're going to talk about today. It's open source software, open hardware and open data. We uh, are about the business of open source, as I've said, and our purpose is UK leadership and global collaboration in open source. And I'd really like to welcome all of you. Some of you have come to us through our founders um, honors list this year, our future founders honors list. Some of you know us already through our legal group, and I know some of you will be watching this in various scale up startups and incubators. And some of you may just be in the business of open source. And that's one of the things that we do at OpenUK. We don't just work with startups and founders. We work with everybody in the business of open source. And it's probably only fair to introduce Dundee, who appears to want to get in on the act today. Um, I'm going to start the consideration of legals with Andrew. And Andrew actually was our original general counsel at Open UK, who we're very grateful to all three of the participants today for the huge amount that they've given to us over the last couple of years. So Andrew, let's go back to basics and start at the beginning. Copyright yeah. and code. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Amanda, and uh, thanks, Dundee. Um, yeah, so I'll probably be, let's turn the clock back a bit. And um, you know, if we go back to the 50s and 60s, computers, you know, they were enormous things. They took up entire floors of buildings. They cost millions. And the focus really was very much um, on, on the hardware, on, on, on the metal. Um, and at that point, um, you know, people hadn't really concentrated on the software as being something that, that, that had value. Um, and especially in academia, people used to transfer information very, very freely to each other. And um, you know, they'd send punch cards and paper tapes and this this sort of thing and there was no real concept of, of not not transferring software to other people I mean certainly you might have commercial organizations who wouldn't do that but they regarded it very much as sort of trade secrets something they wouldn't wouldn't uh, they, they, they wouldn't release to others so uh, in that sort of world the default was sharing sharing software and, and the assumption was that if you had any software there was nothing preventing you from from sharing that with with somebody else and then during the 1960s much smaller computers mini computers occurred and the menu um, appeared and the manufacturers started to realize uh, that they could also make money out of differentiating their different pieces of hardware uh, by having different software running on them. And that really sort of precipitated a debate which really started in the 70s um, around the legislators. 
and, the and uh, they lobbied the legislators to say we need some mechanism to be able to stop people um, you know sharing this software with each other in the same way um, as uh, you know you can't share books you can't you can't share share records you can't share music and so on um, so throughout the 70s, legislature, uh, legislatures throughout the world started to um, pass legislation which um, uh, applied copyright as a concept to computer software. And that really shifted the whole mechanism, the whole idea very, very significantly. The default used to be everyone could share um, their code with other people as long as preventing you from doing that. Now, all of a sudden, it became a situation that uh, software was covered by copyright um, and um, the original owners of the software could obviously do whatever they liked with it, but nobody else could do that unless they had a license. And this is where the sort of concept of a, of, of a legal license arose. And, and the sort of licenses that were, were issued were the sort of licenses that you would have for something like Microsoft Word, for example, which has a bunch of restrictions. So, you know, you may only be able to use Word on your own computer. Um, you're gonna have to pay for it. You're not allowed to reverse engineer it um, and all this, this, this sort of thing. So um, the academics realized that um, uh, they really wanted to maintain between themselves this, this idea of being able to share software. And uh, back in um, 1985, um, the Free Software Foundation um, was established. Um, it was on the 4th of October 1985, which I've only just realized is actually the very day on which I met my now wife. So <laughs> that's a very auspicious day for a number of reasons. Um, and uh, they um, were very keen on the idea, it's an organization that still exists, of sort of keeping, keeping freedom alive in software. And they developed a sequence of licenses um, to enable that to happen. And then a number of years um, later, um, it was realized that, you know, one of the things the Free Software Foundation has always been very clear about is that the software that they promote can always be used in commerce. You know, that, that is, that's a very important freedom. But that message got a little bit mixed up and companies got somewhat confused about whether that was the case or not. So, um, so a, a number of other um, uh, free software proponents decided that they were going to come up with an organization that was more pragmatic and really looking at the, the benefits of, uh, of free software and business. Um, they called themselves the Open Source Initiative, um, and they have a particular licensing structure. So what you're saying, Andrew, there is in short, copyright applies to code. It applies to code whether we choose for it to do so or not. The owner of the code or whoever's commissioned it has that copyright and the way that they can share whether they want it to be free or open or, or proprietary even, the way they share is through a license. So what is open source? And that's a question that actually sometimes has a bit of debate around it. So what open source is for me is code that is distributed in an open source license, which is a license that complies with the open source definition. And that definition has a custodian, which is the open source initiative and licenses go through an approval process. Somebody's going to correct me, but the last time I looked, I think it was 76. I'm terrible with numbers, but I think there's around 76 licenses. So most situations that one can imagine that are covered or need to be covered by the OSD have been covered in those licenses. And um, I think Andrew actually last year, time in the pandemic becomes quite elastic. But last year, I think Andrew, you were one of the authors of a license, which is the, the CERN license, which was the mm -hmm. first license right. that also yeah. covered hardware. So knowing that um, open source requires a license and that it requires an open, open source definition compliant license, my default is to use one that the, the OSI has approved and that's also the OSI's position on this, although there, there can be some debate around it. Knowing all of that, what does that mean for your business? And I think it has a huge impact. So after I left Canonical, I worked in a law firm for a couple of years and I advised a lot of founders and uh, people in startups. And one of the things that I very much discussed with them was what if. So when you're thinking about open sourcing your code and running a business around that code, what if that code is used by third parties? Now, most people are pretty comfortable with that. I suspect everybody in the call understands that that's what open source means. Andrew has just explained all the collaboration and the historical desire to collaborate, which is why open source came into existence. Then um, what if somebody else takes your code and they use it and they make money? And you can see people's approach to that might be slightly different, right? It changes, it shifts the ball game. What if they make money and they make a lot of money 
And even worse, what if they make a lot of money and you don't? And that's a really interesting question. Now, on the subject of questions, I forgot to tell you, please put your questions in the chat. I'll filter them through to the panelists and I'll do that as we go through and I'll do that a little bit more at the end. So for me, when you're thinking about open source in a business, what it means, and uh, my old boss at Canonical, Mark Shuttleworth, I think expresses it beautifully in a, an, an open source underdogs podcast, when he sees that he says that you're enabling your competitors with your own innovation. And that is a net net consequence of running a business that has open source software. There is no way for you to exclude any third party from using that software by field of endeavor, by the fact that they're commercializing it. Now, I'm going to open that particular, what does using an open source license mean to your software if you're in a business, up to the panel? Who'd like to jump in? I'll jump in on one point and distinguish this topic from using open source within your uh, proprietary code. So, uh, so we're focusing here on using, uh, using an open license for your software. You may also be considering developing proprietary software built around a product that is open source or just using open source within your product. Now, the two points to touch on there are really just that uh, you need to understand the license for any open source software that you're using within your uh, own proprietary product. Um, so that will uh, dictate the extent to which you can control future usage. Um, I'm sure everyone will be familiar with uh, the GPL restrictions, which would require that your whole program is then licensed under that GPL. Uh, and whereas if you use uh, other more permissive licenses, you have a more uh, unrestricted ability to use it. So, so a very simple point just to distinguish the two concepts and um, yeah. we're focusing. I think that's a great point. It's a really good point, Rochelle. And when you're using it, even with a GPL, uh, there's often been a lot of fear around that combination of copyleft with proprietary code and the net consequence of that. But of course, uh, the solution, like most uh, legal issues in my mind, the solution's a practical one and there's lots of technical practical solutions that stop that supposedly viral effect happening but there are very definitely two ways we have to think about using open source software using it as part and parcel of a business and then creating a business that's wrapped around it and even if you create a business that's wrapped around the open source software that doesn't mean all the software in the business has to be open source and we've particularly seen that with the, the open core companies now if you are building and distributing open source software of course you're going to be taking contributions and that's something that's been uh, racked with controversy over the, the years. And I know Andrew has some thoughts on. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, most open source projects, successful ones are obviously, as we know, we're, they're built around uh, communities. Um, and that, that really is the core of open, open source success. And everyone that goes into a community, they have certain expectations you know, in, in terms of the way that their code is, is, is going to be used. And um, so Rochelle touched on the, the, the two distinct sorts of, of license. So um, if, you, if you look at look at the GPL and other copyleft licenses, they basically um, have the effect that the code that you're, you're releasing under those licenses will remain forever free. Um, it's not possible for somebody to take that code and incorporate it into their own proprietary product. Um, if they do take that and incorporate it into their own product, then they're going to have to make sure that the source code remains available, that the product is released under that same license, etc. So if you're contributing to um, a, a project that uses a GPL license, like the Linux kernel, for example, your assumption is going to be that you're making this contribution and um, in return, anyone else who takes your work and the work of everyone else is working on it, um, they're, going to, uh, they're, 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 they're going to respect that, that, that freedom. And for that sort of project, it's fairly usual that you, you, you have a, what's known as a license in, license out dynamic. And that basically means that if I'm contributing to the Linux kernel, for example, I'm going to be contributing to the Linux kernel onto the GPL myself. Um, and so that knowing that anyone who's going to be using it is going to be using it under the GPL. And that, that makes the whole thing very fair and equitable. And it has some very interesting consequences, like the fact that um, there are um, you know, tens of thousands of contributors to the, uh, the Linux kernel. Um, you know, you've got Microsoft and IBM and other huge companies, Red Hat at, at one end, and you've got loads of individual contributors at the other. And there's a whole spectrum. And uh, you know, these contributions, they're made under the GPL. And, um, uh, and, and, and there's, there's a, it's developed a real understanding about, about the dynamics and how that works. 
products nobody is ever going to be able to take um, the Linux kernel or at least you know not for, for a century or so and uh, and, and, and close it um, if you're contributing to another sort of project which is which is released under a permissive license so maybe the Apache web server for example um, then that you know you you will be contributing to that on the understanding that your code may well be taken and closed into a completely proprietary product but that's fine because you go in with your eyes open and you know that's going to happen so in that case there's always a danger that um it's it's possible if you perceive it that somebody might take the entire project um and, and close it or the project sponsor may decide to close the whole project but again that's not necessarily a huge problem um, because if they do that, then it means that, uh, you know, most, a lot of the, the, the both the contributors and indeed the users can take the whole of the source code of the project anyway. Um, it's always been available under that Apache license. There's nothing preventing them from taking it and doing what's called forking it. So setting up their own project using the same code and releasing it under probably the same license again. And if, if that happens, the, you know, the dynamic is that um, the uh, developers who are working on the project that's just been closed are probably going to come and join your project because they don't necessarily want to be working on a on a closed project. So the, the sort of um, license that you might grant as a contributor to something like the Apache project is likely to be much, much broader. Um, and you go in with your eyes open, you know that, and there's a number of different license agreements from the, um, the Apache contributor license agreement. Uh, there's a, a set that Amanda is extremely familiar with um, called Project Harmony license agreements, uh, contributor license agreements. So um, the, 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 the way that a contributor contributes to a project um, and the mechanism behind that has a very great bearing on the way that the, the, uh, the expectations of people involved, both the contributors and also the recipients and the, the, the people who are using the project, um, but also has an effect on, on governments as well. That's really helpful. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think there's one other thing maybe that we want to just add to that, which is the DCO, the De 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 Bum Developer Certificate of Originality, which came out of Linux Foundation. And some projects don't require a contribution agreement, but they require that to be signed off by the developers. And that can be an effective way as well. Um, but again, you can see copyright kicking in. And when we're looking at technical legal uh, view on open source and businesses using and building a business around open source, this is an, a critical part of it. What we also see there is community and what contribution builds is community. And in healthy projects, you will generally see a broad range of communities, uh, community contributors, not just uh, contributions from the company itself. And the next session, which is on the 25th, is gonna look a bit more at the models and we'll go in in some detail to the whole sort of concept of open core, the issues that have happened in the last couple of years. But just to, to touch on that, a headline, We've seen certain organizations who have built a business around an open source project, perhaps having not gone through that what if in the first place, or if they have gone through it, perhaps they've seen a shift at a later time in their views on sharing the code for others to use commercially. And we've seen issues around big cloud companies being able to take and use code. I think it was, um, oh, is it James? I can't remember his surname, is it Pritchard? No. James at Pivotal, who described it as, you know, one week you've got a business and the next week you've got a, a feature in the cloud because the cloud companies are able to adopt and use open source projects at pace and, of course, get a great benefit. And we've seen some disruption where some of the open source providers haven't been happy with the way the cloud companies have used that. Now, that's something we'll discuss in a lot more depth on the 25th, but it's just worth headlining that here, I think. Um, and with an open core company, what happens is that the core software is open source, but of course you then have um, additional products that are proprietary or services that are proprietary around that. And we see two kinds of that open core, tight and loose as they're defined by Adam Jacob. Um, Adam Jacob was uh, one of the co-founders of Chef and his blogs around this are really worth reading if you want to understand how that works. And in one instance, you'll see that the company is very much the driver in the open source project and the community is a sort of afterthought. And in the other, what you'll see is that the community is vital to the project. And I would say that those are, if you're ever looking, the healthier open source projects and the size and the contribution level of that community is a real indicator as to the likelihood that a, a business will stay open source it's much more likely that a, a business that has an open source project that is the custodian of, which has a small community will shift. 
And as Andrew says, you then have forking and forking is the ultimate um, control that a community has or a customer has over anything that's open source in a business. And we saw that last year with Elastic when they moved to the proprietary SSPL license. What happened there was that the original open source project effectively became the fork. And I believe it's still maintained by AWS. Another, a number of other contributors like Ivan are involved. Um, whereas Elastic now has a proprietary version that they continue to use and distribute and many of the customers still use. Um, but that is a, a topic that we will definitely go into more on the 25th. Now, one of the, the things that that raises is your non-code assets and licensing non-code assets. And I think there's sometimes some confusion because Creative Commons allows non-commercial licensing. So there is a specific license within Creative Commons. And Andrew, you may want to comment on this. You probably know it better than I do. But there is a license that allows non-commercial usage. Creative Commons wasn't developed for code. And we really advise against you doing using it for that and to use an open source software license. But I think sometimes people who come from the commons who are maybe not entirely immersed in open source or come from business and they're just learning about open get the two confused. And there is no version of an open source license that allows a, a discrimination on field of endeavor. It's open source definition six, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, you cannot exclude commercial usage for open source. Andrew, did you want to add to that? Yeah, well, actually ties in perfectly well with an excellent question that um, we've just asked. Um, I'm not going to mention whose name it is because I, I don't know if we're able to do that. Um, uh, but the uh, the question um, is about um, a JavaScript library that somebody wants to open source, but they want to try to prevent that library from being used uh, to replicate a particular platform that it's, um, it, it's being used to operate at the moment. Um, and I think that's a really good example of how, unfortunately, yep. you know, that's a field of endeavor you can't restrict that if you as soon as you start adding clauses to open source licenses you are in very dangerous territory um, and, a, and, a, and a restriction like that would um, take the license outside the scope of open source um, so the answer to that is you know and um, there's a lot of good reasons why people want to do this sort of thing and, and people have been trying to come up with um, sort of close open source licenses but not quite um, you know for many many years um, but you no know, that that wouldn't be open source you can place a restriction in a license sure but it's not going to be an open source license if you do yeah that. and just to <laughs> Just to pick up on that, if you want to read more around this topic, because this is obviously a short session today covering a lot of different topics, um, the Commons Clause and the commentary around that would probably be the best place to look. The Commons Clause is an add-on provision. It was generated by a lawyer for Redis. Um, Redis were not happy, again, with the big cloud companies and the revenue situation. They wanted to put an extra clause in and adding that extra clause stops the license being an OSI approved or OSD compliant license. So you really have to think about that. And I think this question is absolutely spot on, because if I was advising you, which I'm not in a, a startup situation, I'd go back to my what if you cannot restrict anybody. Now, that that applies also if you feel that your restriction is not a commercially based one, but an ethically based one. And there's a series of uh, proposals to the open source initiative for license approval, which uh, didn't work either, weren't approved either, which had ethics as the basis of the, the discrimination of field of endeavor. So perhaps something like uh, no munitions manufacturers can use my code. Now, what you can do, and what has been done is you can put a notice in your code, but it's non-binding and it's not gonna affect the license. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are ways of making your feelings felt, but you won't be able to uh, do anything that restricts in that way and still have open source. Doesn't mean you can't do that as a license and that that's entirely your decision. And it might be that that's better for the business model. And I think it gets back to this key point that we would probably recommend you don't open source if you don't understand how you're going to do a business model around it. As a, as a group of lawyers. Now, if you listen to last week's conversation, there was some really interesting debate, and I know Matt's on this call, but Matt had um, uh, two or three founders, including Tom Wilkie, uh, who were really discussing, Tom's at Grafana, who were really discussing this in depth. And I would recommend, if you wanna think more about that, they were recommending you start a project before you've worked out your business model. As a group of lawyers, we're telling you to work out your business model before you decide to open source. Now, we're sort of halfway through our session and we intended to pivot at this point 
and to start to talk about corporate structures and then we're going to talk a little bit about liability and contracts depending on how much time we've got. Um, I think there are a couple more questions so it might be worth just running through those or at least one before we move away from the licensing and also saying that if you want to ask anything more about licensing, if you want to ask anything more about contribution or copyright, drop that in the chat now. So Andrew, the new sponsors only. Ah, yeah, I saw that for the first time this morning. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to review it. It hit my mailbox today. Uh, I'm not up to speed with that, so it'd be useful to know no. a bit more about Lorenzo it. Lorenzo yeah. obviously is ahead of the curve here. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it's around maintenance and rewarding contribution that's financial to open source. But I, I honestly don't know. I do know that there have been one or two controversies. Um, talking of GitHub, one of the legal issues that people have complained about is that GitHub doesn't require a license to be put on code. And of course, as Andrew explained, nobody else can use code unless they have a license. And ideally that's in writing. And there has been a change where GitHub now, when you come to the licensing box, explains that and mm -hmm. explains what open source is. So unless there are any more questions, this is your last call. You can always ask more questions later, of course, but we'll, we'll pivot and we'll start to talk about company structures. And for any of you joining us internationally, we're pretty much focused here in this conversation on UK company structures. And I'm gonna hand over to Chris to talk a little bit about those company structures. Sure. Thanks, uh, Amanda. So <clears throat> limited companies and thinking about how you maximize your, your IP and structure so that you can maximize the, the benefit from your IP. Um, so I guess the first question is, how do you best leverage your IP when it comes to getting investment? Because um, obviously that's a crucial question for uh, a lot of startups and early stage companies. Well, first of all, in order to get investment, you're going to need something to invest in. And a limited company is the usual vehicle for this, uh, which is, I'm sure, as you already know, has its own separate legal personality. Uh, and that means it's treated as if it were a separate person in the eyes of the law. It's referred to as limited because of the, um, the, the fact that the liability exposure of the investors is limited to the amount that they invest. Um, and that can be contrasted with a partnership model uh, which might arise simply because people are working together where all of the partners take full liability for the business. So that's one reason that it's important to get a corporate vehicle set up at the earliest opportunity to uh, protect yourself from uh, potential liabilities of the business. Now, prospective investors in your company are going to want to see good governance when it comes to IP, and it's important to be able to demonstrate that you have that covered. So when I talk about IP, I don't just mean your code base and related materials, although that will likely be the crux of it, um, but I'm referring here more broadly to uh, copyrights, database rights, design, uh, trademarks and patents, as well as a number of related uh, and associated rights. So the first thing to think about is who holds the key IP that you're going to need for the business. Now, depending on how you're set up, it might be that the IP is already held by you or by your company, if you've got one, uh, or it may be that it's held by the developers you're working with or the collaborators on a project, depending on what the contractual arrangements are um, that you've got in place there, if you've got development contracts or if you've got employment relationships uh, that exist between uh, the various participants in the project. And then the next question you need to ask is, well, okay, so all these rights exist, but what rights do I need in order to operate the business? And do I have them? Has IP already been open sourced or does it remain closed right now? And if the latter, how do you derive your rights? And if the former, how does that support or undermine your business plan and your business model? And Amanda alluded to a, a future session on, uh, on business models. And then you need to think about whether the existing arrangements allow you to scale the business or would it be better to own any closed code um, within the company rather than take a license from whoever owns it right now? If you're holding IP within a corporate structure, it's quite common to use an IP holding company whose sole purpose is to house the IP and to license it to the rest of the corporate group. Um, so, for example, you might have a parent company which um, holds the IP and also holds the entire investment in 100% of the, the share capital in 
a subsidiary, which is the trading company, the one that actually operates the business. Now that can have a number of advantages, such as allowing you to benefit from certain tax reliefs, uh, as well as helping to protect that core IP if the worst happens and the trading company gets into financial difficulty or finds itself the target of litigation. But perhaps most crucially for early stage companies is that VCs who come and invest later will often want to see all IP owned by the group holding company um, to the extent that it's not um, open source. It's a, a relatively simple structured setup, but there are some legal requirements around intra-group licensing that you do need to get right. Um, particularly if you want to take advantage of things like patent box tax regimes. So I'd always recommend talking to a professional like me or Andrew um, to ensure that it gets done in the right way. Um, speaking of governance, uh, there's a, a great standard called Open Chain, which I think we had planned to talk about, but we're probably going to be a bit short of time. Um, it, essentially, it's an ISO standard for open source uh, governance. Um, and whilst it's entirely possible to achieve conformance yourself, again, I'd suggest talking to um, someone like me or Andrew. Um, Andrew was actually involved in um, in creating the the, uh, the standard um, to help you then to navigate your way to good governance. Um, and that's a really good way of, um, of making sure you've got all your boxes ticked. Uh, Amanda, I think you wanted to touch on the subject of patents here as well. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Chris. Um, just on open chain, Open chain compliance is something that I think is really important and we see it as an ISO standard as of about 18 months ago now, I think. We also see SPDX on the bill of materials side and increasingly, if you want your code to be adopted, you're going to need to have that compliance because it's going to be something that major companies specify contractually. So for that ubiquity that we get around open source, that we get through GitHub type adoption, um, I think that there's going to be a little bit of qualification that we see as time goes by as more and more of these big companies require open chain license compliance, but also SBOMs, Software Bill of Materials, which is what SPDX governs. This has really hit the headlines in the last um, six to nine months. And that's been partly around the US where the White House is engaged in security has been looking at how SBOMs are going to apply. And then, of course, in the run-up to Christmas, we saw Log4j and a, a security issue where the, the, the focus has been accentuated on that. So if you're looking at your governance um, and licensing, I suggest you look at both of those. I was going to pick up on patents, and I've been involved with Open Invention Network for full disclosure since I was at Canonical. Um, I took Canonical in, and we put, I, I think, $5 million in as an associate member rather than go off and register patents. And we decided that community contribution was a better way to do it. Um, OIN is funded by a number of large companies putting that kind of money in to stop litigation around the patent space. And you will all have seen the sort of spider's web of litigation that happened with Android. No incumbent likes their market being disrupted. And that's what was happening in the mobile phone space with the Android operating system and the retaliation was to use patents, a war chest of patents to fight back um, through patent litigation. And the way that works is if you have a patent, you're able to sue anybody who is in breach of your patent. Now, a patent is not like copyright. Copyright applies to the way you've done something. It applies to the, the instance of the iteration of the idea. A patent applies to an idea. So effectively, when you give somebody a patent, you grant them a monopoly, and it's supposed to encourage innovation, although whether we could say it does that in software, at least in my personal opinion, it doesn't, but it's pretty dubious across the board. So if you have a patent, what you can do is stop anybody else um, doing anything with that same idea, using that same idea through the patent and through litigation. Um, there are ways of dealing with it. One is to have the patent set aside if you can show prior art and you can show that the, the idea actually existed before. And you would think in open source that that would be super, super easy, right? Because everything is out there, everything's on repos, everybody's shared the code. The reality is the patent office can only spend a certain amount of time reviewing each patent. And what you find, uh, the last time I looked anyway, was a 20 minute process and the, in the US where most of these uh, are registered, there were only two databases being reviewed. So one of the things that you can do defensively as well as um, cross sue getting another patent is to have a patent set aside. And in getting that set aside, you can work with organizations like OIN, Open Invention Network to do so. And OIN actually today 
is the biggest challenger of software patents in the US and has had a number of patents set aside or it's helped organizations to do that. Now, you could spend the whole hour talking about all of this and patents, and I'm not going to do that, but it's worth understanding the open source response to something that is potentially restrictive. And it's not been so much a licensing response as a collaborative response. And OIN is at its heart a defensive patent pool. And everybody who joins this organization says that they are going to not sue anybody else in the organization on any patents that exist at the time or going forwards. You can leave it, but when you're in it, you've given a perpetual, i.e. an everlasting license to use your patents. So once you've gone in, you can't take it back, at least for the group who were in the pool. So it's a, a sort of um, cooperative of non-suit, non-suing around patents. If anybody wants to talk more about that, I can either talk to you or put you in touch with the right people. But if you have any uh, issues with patents as an open source organization or an open source founder, I would recommend you speak to the OIN team who are always there as a sort of a good citizen and friend to OIN. Now, as they say in advertising, there is more than one source of defensive patenting around open source. OIN is free. I don't believe any of the others are. So OIN is free for you to sign up to. But there's things like license on transfer. There are other projects, all of which take this defensive, collaborative community response to avoiding patent attacks. Um, I don't really want to say any more on it, but I just want to check that nobody wants to add anything or I've missed anything. No. OK, good. Yeah. So we're going to move on to trademarks and um, Andrew's going to pick up on trademarks. And one of the, the, the most interesting things that I, I know around open source and trademarks is that the OSI, the Open Source Initiative, does not have a trademark in open source. And one of the lawyers who works with them a huge amount is Pamela Chestick, who has some uh, great tools that I'm sure Andrew's going to talk to you about. But uh, I guess it must be heartbreaking for Pam that she represents an organization <laughs> that failed to get its trademark. Andrew. Yeah, um, the interaction between trademarks and, uh, and open source is, is really quite an interesting one because, you know, we've talked earlier about this idea of forking. So basically, you know, one of the things that you're guaranteed in an open source project is that anyone can take the whole code base, copy it and spin up their own version of the, uh, of the software if they, if they want to. Um, and you might think that, uh, you know, that tends to lead to a sort of huge proliferation of, of, of competing projects all, all based off the same code base. Um, and there's a number of reasons why that, that doesn't happen, but one of the most um, prominent ones is, is really uh, the effect of trademarking. So a community um, will um, typically come up with the name of their, their project. Um, so it could be, I don't know, Gnome, for example. Um, and they um, then um, what they will do is they will um, apply for a trademark. I mean, I'm not going to go into trademark law in, in, in great depth. I mean, trademarks, um, uh, broadly speaking, there are two types, registered and unregistered. And you, you, you get a lot more protection um, with a registered uh, trademark. So um, if projects can register a trademark, then that, that's going to be better. And what happens if you have a trademark is that it stops other people making unfair use of that trademark. And it's really interestingly goes right back to the um, the, 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 the sort of the basis of trademark law in the first place, which was, is to, it, it's almost a consumer protection measure. It's something so that consumers can be sure that um, the, the source and the origin and the quality of a particular good or service um, is assured. And it's why certain organizations, once they apply for a trademark, uh, that means that, uh, you know, they are the only people who are allowed to use that trademark in most circumstances. Um, and, um, that means that you know if you're if you're dealing, for example, you know you're buying your favourite brand of uh, of um, of yeast spread, um, and it happens to be called Marmite, then you know that it comes from a particular organisation who maintains quality control. If they let somebody else make that spread, uh, then uh, they will have exercised um, control over it to make sure it's up to the standards that you, you expect. So it's, it's sort of two sided thing. One side is consumer protection, because when you when you're buying or service goods or services under a particular trademark, that gives you the consumer the assurance that it has a, a certain provenance. Um, but obviously, everyone knows that trademarks have become immensely valuable things because companies license and, and, uh, and, and transfer them to each other for vast amounts of money as well. And from an 
open source perspective, quite a lot of this is, is actually based on the original idea of, of consumer protection. Um, now, one interesting thing that, um, you know, we, we've talked earlier about the effect of open source licenses and the way we know that they guarantee that anyone receiving the license uh, can exercise a wide range of rights um, in the code, both under copyright and patent that might be applicable to the code. But one thing they don't cover is trademark. So you do not get any automatic right under an open source software license to use the trademark. Now, you can use it in a, in a sort of fair way. I mean, if, if you've, um, you know, if, if you've uh, uh, maybe um, downloaded um, you know the uh, Apache web server um, then you can you can create a new web server and you can say based on Apache because that's just a factual statement and it's true but you can't suggest that it has been um, endorsed in some way by the Apache Software Foundation and that really gives um, the holders of the trademarks who are typically foundations um, you know a lot of power um, because it means that uh, they generate the quality in the brand and uh, they can maintain sorry they can maintain the quality in that brand and they mean that it it means that if somebody tries to fork it, they're going to have to uh, generate their own brand. They can't sort of piggyback off the um, of, of the original brand as well. So there's this is sort of quite interesting um, interrelationship um, between the two, and it also tends to have an, an um, um, a, a, a reductive effect on people trying to fork projects because they know that if they just fork it, they can use the code. That's fine, uh, but they're going to have to be very very careful. Um, when they're um, referring to the, to the trademark under which the uh, under which that code was released in the first place, and you you touch on foundations there. Yeah. Do you want to say anything more about foundations? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this this really goes to the the the, the, the root of. Um, I suppose the first question we need to ask is, you know, why why, why does open source work? And uh, quite often you'll get a company that's um, that, that's got a software um, product, um, and they will decide to open source it. And you know, the first reaction to that is, you know, why would they do that? Why would you want to make some software which you have worked extremely hard on, invested huge amounts of money, and why would you might want to make that freely available to everyone, just basically giving away? Um, your IP, you know, surely, surely that that's just giving away assets. And the best way to look at it really is is to um, think of it in terms of it enables this, you know, incredibly powerful mutual form of research and development, which is why some of the most effective um, open source software projects are sort of projects for really foundational things. I mean, we've talked about um, the Linux kernel, which is at the core of, you know, any number of devices from every Android phone to, um, um, you know, televisions, toasters, fridges, uh, whatever. Um, we've, um, and, and we, we, we touched on the um, Apache um, web server as well. Now, the reality is, you know, nobody is going to uh, buy a particular product from you because you happen to use the Apache web server. You know, nobody's going to think, hey, Amazon, that's a great company to buy things from because they use the Apache web server. It's not differentiating. It doesn't matter which web server you use. Um, what you're, you know, but from the customer's perspective, all they want is something that's delivered. So it makes sense for organizations for this sort of technology to say, okay, rather than continuing to develop our own private web server, why don't we make it available to everyone? Um, and then rather than having to apply 100 developer days a year, um, sorry, a, a day to, um, uh, to developing the thing, um, you know, we can spread that amongst any number of organizations. And our, so the, the, the amount of resource that we have to apply to this particular project um, reduces dramatically. So this is, this is the, really the origin of an awful lot of open source software projects. Um, and when that happens, there has to be some um, mechanism for retaining governance around the project. And typically what they'll do is they'll spin up a foundation, um, which is a non-for-profit entity. Um, the legal structure varies from country to country. They tend not to be charitable for various reasons because it's difficult to get them within the definition of a charity but they tend to be not not for profit and the idea is that um, the organization who who sponsors that project the one that uh, has maybe developed it in the first place um, but um, you know wants to continue to provide ongoing financial support etc involvement in it um, they want to distance themselves from it to agree to a degree so the rest of the community feels comfortable that this project can't suddenly become evil. It can't go off in a direction that they don't want it um, to go. So the relationship between um, a sponsoring company 
and its foundation, it really varies very, very dram dramatically. There are some companies that have an extremely close relationship with their foundation and the foundation is essentially controlled by that one company. Um, you know, that provides certainty for the sponsoring company, but it makes it quite difficult to attract a community because the community um, is always concerned that they're not going to have enough voice and that suddenly the aims of the foundation are going to sort of veer off into a different direction. Um, or you have um, uh, organizations where that connection is much looser and much more control is given to the members of the community um, and uh, you know examples of uh, foundations are um, so for example the Linux Foundation which is a foundation of foundations um, and the Eclipse Foundation which is also a foundation of foundations so each of those two foundations are sponsors for a, a number of different sub, sub projects um, and and what they're trying to do is to provide a sort of balance between the the interests of the community because you know, as we discussed before, without a community, you know, an open source project is nothing. Um, and the interests of those organizations that are providing sponsorship, which could be in terms of cash or it could be in terms of um, other in-kind donations, including developer time as well. Yeah. So this is something that, you know, we, we talk about this, this, this a lot in the world of open source. Foundations are extremely um, important um, and they're sort of always very conscious of their role to balance the interests um, of the people who are providing financial and resource sponsorship and also the individual developers as well. Um, and obviously they want to make sure that the projects that they're sponsoring are also attractive to the end users. Um, and for so, this audience, mm. I guess that their importance is when we look at someone like Matt, Matt Barker, who is our entrepreneur in residence and who's been leading these Founder Forums trainings, Matt's company Jetstack uh, actually donated to Cloud Native uh, Foundation, which is one of the Linux Foundation sub foundations. Chris, one of the things that happens with these foundations, with projects, and in particular, if you're a founder with a company that you're about to set up, or some of the packages that you're working on is naming. And we, we've touched on that a little bit in trademarks, but I think it's worth just circling back to you and asking a, a bit more about that. Yeah, that's right. Um, when, it, when it comes to the, the foundations piece, I like the phrase that, um, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So that's um, what what always what I keep in the back of my mind when thinking about that collaborative effect. But um, yeah, so about naming then. So we talked a bit about um, brand and there remains this question as to how you go about naming projects, products and your business, um, treating those three things as, as, as very distinct. So my advice would be to think about branding from the very start because projects turn into products which then create businesses. And you don't necessarily have to name your product the same as the project or indeed, you know, as the business, but it could be difficult to change along the way, depending on who's involved, you know, the various stakeholders. Um, re remember that the business and the product can have very different branding um, and you may wish to uh, protect both, not, not just necessarily one. You probably want your brand to be creative, distinctive and memorable. And the trademark system is set up to support that. Um, in fact, it's very hard to pr protect a descriptive name like open document for your open source document management service. Um, for example, uh, in the open source world, Linux distro is a good example of projects that have historically done this um, very well at adopting distinctive names. You know, think of Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, Fedora. Um, they're all good examples of strong brand names. One of the first things you'll probably think of when you're naming your uh, business is whether a suitable do domain name is available. Uh, and how much it will cost. I'd recommend getting a second pair of eyes on whatever you're thinking about using as your URL because they may spot something that you've missed. Uh, you might have come across a business selling stationery called Pen Island. Now, I don't know if they ever wrote it down without spacing as you would with a URL before they decided to go with it. Um, but if you would see it written down, you'd, you'd, you'd instantly tell why. Um, in terms of picking a company name, uh, so Companies House will not register a company whose name is identical to another name on the register. Uh, and we're talking about um, UK companies here. So it, it's always worth doing a search on the Companies House register before picking a name. That's available on the um, on their website. So you can, you can do that search yourself. Um, the exception to this, of course, is where the company being registered is part of the same group as the company uh, for obvious reasons. You also need to avoid company names that are politically sensitive uh, or ostensibly offensive because Companies House will refuse to register those. Uh, I won't give examples. Um, 
it, it's always helpful to do a search on the relevant trademark register as well to see what trademarks are out there that are similar to your desired name uh, and consider your risk of trademark infringement based on that because if your proposed brand name is identical to an existing trademark okay it might not be a deal breaker if the trademark is related to very different goods and services but uh, companies whose brands are very well known uh, can have a wider scope of protection than just purely what they're doing right now. Um, so they might um, be able to, to bring an action in trademark infringement, even if your products are quite dissimilar. If it's an identical, um, if, 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 the, if the brand is identical or similar to an existing mark in the same area of business, you probably need to think again. Um, although what I would say is get some early advice um, on this about checking for, for possible conflicts with pre-existing third-party brand names. You, you don't need to do it at the very beginning, um, but you should probably do it before you commit major resources to marketing, yeah. just in case there's a problem. And um, I think, Chris, that sort of aligns with the advice we've already given around thinking your business model through. If you're you're OK, I think we can probably pivot a little bit here because we've only got a few minutes left and we yeah. we've covered most of what we wanted to around the corporate setup around intellectual property and protecting your intellectual property and a good bit about licensing. But something that we've not touched on that is really, really topical is standards. And I think when we think about open source, effectively, we create de facto standards, but increasingly standards are becoming important. So Rochelle, would you like to jump in and talk to us a bit about those? Sure. And um, I think the concept of considering where you are in the market and defining exactly where uh, where you want to sit within the market um, has to be considered alongside open standards because uh, whether or not an open standard is applicable to uh, to the area your product sits within um, has a huge huge role both in terms of what should you be uh, considering as your minimum standards firstly uh, secondly um, are there extra opportunities um, so. What are open standards? Um, basically, uh, there's a number of ways to define it. Um, I would I would say essentially it's areas of a product where interoperability has been identified um, as key to enabling participation. So, I guess a classic example could be um, how do we how did we end up with a scenario where uh, hardware have has the same standards for connecting with Wi-Fi? Um, that's an open standard they can be either formally developed or something that evolves through custom. Um, two huge legal topics that uh, that are developing and, as Amanda said, are really topical at the moment. Um, one is who actually governs the standard. So it's easy to uh, to hear of a legal concept like open standards and assume that uh, that they'll all sit within a standard repository and it will be um, it will be a, a static uh, easily identifiable concept uh, it isn't the case um, especially for those standards that develop uh, in kind of a um, in an ad hoc manner um, and uh, and what I would say when you're looking at the market that you're looking to operate in and when you're taking the time to uh, to kind of identify what the open standard context is for your area. Uh, do your research around around the different areas. Um, the the stakeholder groups um, are often a really good place to start. So, for example, if you're uh, in the cloud uh, area, uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, has has a lot of um, really clear material around what open standards might be applicable. Um, <clears throat> the second topic, which is quite a big one, is uh, using open source uh, or versus using proprietary technology within an open standard. So uh, you might identify that uh, something that you um, want to uh, use as your business case um, has an open standard applicable and uh, you might identify that in order to uh, sell to uh, government procurement or otherwise you'll need to comply with the open standard. Uh, the open standard might prescribe uh, that you uh, need to actually utilize certain proprietary products within your product. Um, now, these have to be licensed on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, um, which is a very tricky concept in itself um, and, uh, and subject to all sorts of different treatment depending on the jurisdiction. So, uh, so I know 
between the US and, uh, and Europe, uh, there's evolving areas of law relating to whether or not uh, licensing has been fair, reasonable and uh, non-discriminatory. Um, the other thing to consider is that uh, some open standards include open source. So uh, that's, that's actually a topic in itself as to whether or not whether or not open standards should all be based around open source because it has all of the many advantages that um, Amanda's outlined. So that's an area where we're very interested um, in developing as well. So uh, the probably the key takeaways um, in this very high level snapshot is just understand the uh, open standard context within uh, within the area or the market you're considering. Thanks very much, Rochelle. Now, I, I think that's really interesting. And what you get a sense, I hope, thereof is that with all these different topics, they could within themselves be a, a whole Irish session. But I hope that we've given you a taste for each of them. Um, you may also want to think about contracts. And with contracts, when we're looking at commercialization of open source, we're not just looking at a business model, but we're looking at the contracts and the risk that your organization takes. And the one thing that I, I think is really worth taking away from this session today, when we, we don't really have time to go into a massive depth, is the fact that when you have a commercial contract around an open source project or product, the license, the distribution, the sharing of the code is already done in the open source license. So the commercial contract that you're adding on is around your business model. It's around a service or something that you're providing to the customer above and beyond the open source software. So you are not actually distributing the software under that license. If you're creating something specific to the customer, you might be doing some software distribution in addition to that core licensing, but you're likely to be providing subscription support or something else. So when you're thinking about liabilities and risks, you should also bring that in. Um, I will, after this call, have a chat with Matt about whether we bring a bit more on contracts into the session on commercial models, which might be useful to you. But I just want to run around the panelists and I'm going to start with Andrew and you've got 30 seconds, Andrew, really, as we get ready to wrap up. If you were to give a founder, like the, the potential founders on the session today, one piece of legal learning that they should take into developing an open source business, what would that be? I think it's not necessarily even legal learning. Um, I think it's I think it's a question of the importance of of, of, of community, and it, it's almost being wary of the the advice um, that that you will be given to protect your IP at all costs. You need to know which IP you do want to protect, um, and we've talked about brand protection, for example, that's extremely important. Um, and you need to think very hard about whether you need to register any patents or not, how you're going to deal with those, etc. That is all important. Um, but um, you need to think about the quid pro quo uh, between um, making your IP available to other people through open sourcing, the benefits you get back from that um, uh, compared with um, keeping the IP um, to yourself, yeah. um, which of course, then you can talk to VCs about using that to raise funding, et cetera. Yeah. So I think be pragmatic um, about your IP is, is probably my advice. Brilliant, thank you, Andrew. As Liz Rice pointed out in the first session two weeks ago, um, VCs do like to see that you hold some IP and just because you're an open source organization or an organization based on open source software doesn't mean you, you can't do that. So Rochelle, can I come to you next with the one piece of advice that you would give a founder? Sure. So uh, I think Andrew mentioned community and what I would definitely want to emphasize, uh, I think, linked to the understanding, uh, the standard context you uh, operate within is uh, a lot of what we touch on. Uh, there's there's so many decisions that you'll need to make relating to licensing um, and context is everything. So engage with communities specific to the product type, specific to the industry that you're in. Um, and that's a hugely valuable way to, uh, to sort of really uh, get clarity on some of those decisions and really understand uh, what what sort of licensing um, directions are going to help you when you're uh, when you're answering some of these questions. Thanks, Rochelle. Chris, 
Yeah, very quick cautionary tale from me. So um, in November, I was approached by a group of founders who wanted to launch a business in emerging technologies. And they had this great, uh, great idea. They had a load of customers lined up. They were re almost ready to go live. They wanted some contracts, very quick job. What they hadn't realized, uh, and they wanted to launch in January, by the way, um, what, what they hadn't realized is what they wanted to do was regulated. And actually they needed to go to the FCA and get registration. Um, and therefore, they couldn't launch in January in the UK as planned. It was going to take at least six months. So what I would say is whatever you're doing, go and talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Go and talk to a professional in advance with plenty of time, not immediately before you plan to launch. Um, because, you know, protecting IP, particularly trademarks and, and, and registered IP, um, getting clearances, uh, getting permits, getting everything lined up takes a little bit of time. So don't just assume you can do it overnight. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Chris. And I suppose my final piece is to go back to the what if that I shared with you before. So understand what an open source license is. Understand if you're founding a business and that you're going to be relying on open source for your revenue generation. Understand what open source means. Understand what the license means. And then understand how that's going to impact any revenue generation and business model that you're going to wrap around the open source. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today there is no session next week as we've already mentioned we're back on the 25th everybody's getting a break around half term and we will be back looking at commercialization and business models on the 25th thanks very much chris andrew and rochelle for joining us today and for all your work for open uk very well see you all next time everyone thank you, thank you.